Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Bottled, Barreled, and Brewed. I'm your host, Cooper Green. We are in Nashville, Tennessee this week, and I'm super psyched because I was born and raised here. We've got some amazing spots lined up for us to check out, so uh, let's get rolling. Okay, so for stop number one, we're in Franklin, Tennessee, just south of Nashville. We're at the factory right now. There's all kinds of cool stuff in here, but my favorite thing is Honest Coffee Roasters. So we're gonna hang with those guys, see how they make the magic happen. All right, so we're here with Brad Hendricks of Honest Coffee Roasters. So when you come into a place like this and you look at the menu, uh, someone might see words like cortado and mm -hmm. cappuccino. What do those words mean and what is the difference maybe between those drinks? It's basically based on the milk to espresso ratio. Gotcha. Uh, cortado is gonna be a one to one milk espresso ratio mm -hmm. with about two ounces of each, whereas a cappuccino is gonna be a two to one ratio where there's about four ounces of milk and then two ounces of espresso. Gotcha. And then when you get up to lattes, the lattes can be up to 16 ounces total Wow. So it can be something like a eight to one or six to one. For someone who has never been to a specialty coffee shop, what is the biggest difference between here and, and maybe your average coffee place? Honestly, it starts at the source. We get a lot of coffees in from farmers all across the world. We sample roast them, we cup them, and our goal is to keep true the spirit of the coffee that they harvested and add as little to the process as possible because every time we add, we're actually taking away the goodness that they have given us. Right. So we want to represent them well and be a connection basically between farmers all over the world and our guests that come in here every day. I'd love to start making something because I think really, like you were saying, it's in the process of making that you see the attention to detail and the quality. How about we make, uh, say, like a cortado? Sure. Not that's because right. that's my favorite drink or anything. No, not at all. <laughs> Get my milk ready first. Cool. It's from a farm in Russellville, Kentucky. Okay, awesome. So it's as local as we can get. Right now I'm uh, preparing the espresso. Cool, we and you're weighing that out. Exactly, yeah. yep. So this is gonna help with consistency cool. every time, so we make sure that we weigh out how much coffee goes into our portafilter, how much coffee is coming out at the end. Okay. And then we have a time frame we wanna see that happen in. So you're using a, a bottomless portafilter. A regular portafilter will have two little spouts, um, and this is just flat on the bottom. What's the, yes. what's the reasoning behind that? It's for us to be able to see if the shot is extracting properly. Gotcha. The spouts, because of them being on the bottom of the portafilter, covers up what's happening inside of the brewing chamber. Gotcha. So we can't see what's happening. It could be under extracting or over extracting. The shot could be doing something wild that <laughs> we can't see. When you're steaming your milk, what yeah. are you looking for? One of the main things is we want to get a good aeration. That's that paper ripping sound. And then once we get past that point, a nice board up. Gotcha. Um, in the middle of the picture. Yeah, I think the comparison I've heard is kind of like wet paint. Yes, exactly. It's nice and thick. Uh, yeah. You can't eat paint, though. No. Right now I'm pouring, breaking up the crema. What exactly is that? So it's gonna be a lot of the soluble solids that are left during the brewing process okay. that goes through. It's actually probably the most bitter part of the shot. Interesting. But you want it to be present there to indicate that you've extracted properly, but you also don't want to be tasting Too all much crema. Of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is beautiful. Thank I'm you, sir. going to try it because that's a perk of the job. Exactly. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. It's definitely my go-to, and you guys do a awesome. really good job with it. Thank you. All right, so the next drink we're going to make is called the sarsaparilla. Is yes, that correct? that is correct. We start with the cup, and we start with some syrup. This is our sarsaparilla syrup, called sassy for short. <laughs> I like it. We do 0.8 ounces of that. So this is drip coffee. Obviously a little different from espresso as far as how you make it. Are these using the same beans or are they different beans? We have an approach called omni-roasting, so that okay. means we roast to get the best out of the coffee as opposed to trying to roast for espresso or for drip or for pour over. Oh, interesting. It's not necessarily about a darker roast for espresso and a lighter roast for drip. Sure. It's more about which coffee is gonna be suited for which station best. All right, so we've got our drip. Now yes. what? So we're gonna add some layer of cream to the top. So what is, what is this specifically? So it's heavy cream mixed with some cardamom. It is gonna give a nice caramely and brown sugary taste. It gives That's a good beautiful. presentation element as well. And you're using the back of the spoon so it has something to kind of coast onto before exactly, it Exactly, yep. We got some of our bitters right here. So there you are, the sarsaparilla. That is beautiful, I am so excited. 
That's so cool. I love that. That head of head of cream is amazing. Because sarsaparilla is what would be used in root beer, correct? Right. So exactly. you get that kind of caramely sweetness. You also have a little bit of that from the coffee. A plus, dude. Awesome. That's awesome. To take it all the way back to the beginning. How did Honest Coffee get its start? Yeah, so actually right out these doors, we started in the lobby of the factory where no um, we had a little coffee cart mm -hmm. with a little press machine, a grinder, and a little water tank in there. So it was like a desk on wheels that we could serve coffee. The dream started there where we introduced specialty coffee to Franklin. It, yeah. it speaks so heavily into what coffee was made for, and yeah. it's for people to enjoy, people to sit around and have a family discussion and also mm. share quality time. Getting into roasting, what was that like for you? Was that a lot of experimentation? Did you start at home? All of it, what's up? I got influenced with Honest, mm. so I saw that whole process. I'm like, I want to take that home and do it. <laughs> cool. So I bought a little popcorn popper. Uh, it's like the Poppery 2, which is like the classic go-to, like right. the legendary home roaster and just started playing around. I would order like little green samples from different companies mm -hmm. and yeah, I just started reading more and more about roasting and the science and what it is and different types of roasters. Just any little thing I could get my hand on. It's super funny that you mentioned the popcorn popper because yeah. I totally bought a popcorn popper ro yes. roasting like 100 grams at a time. Okay. Uh, and I went from that to like a one pound drum roaster. I imagine it's a little bit more intense when you go from that to the giant roaster here in the center of the store. What was that like? There was a little bit of anxiety. Just sure. Because you're going from like, okay, I can ruin just a little bit of coffee <laughs> or I can ruin a whole lot of coffee. Yeah. It's funny because you can take all of those characteristics that anybody can do at home. Like anybody can get a popcorn popper and roast coffee and see the development happen. That's cool. And so you can take that and put it in this big drum where it's like, okay, it's still the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's heat, airflow, and watching your time. Yeah. That's all it is, but if it is on a larger scale. This is not a brewer, it's not a grinder, it is a coffee roaster. Okay. And there's heat going up the bottom onto the drum. It's indirect heat. The beans just rotate throughout the entire drum and they cook over time. Okay. So they start roasting, they start changing color from green to brown, and that's where the magic happens. Okay, so once you put the beans in that top hopper, what is your job? So every 15 seconds, I'm checking the temp on the drum, uh -huh. which is right here, and then I'm also checking the temp on the beans, which is this bean probe, and then making gas adjustments, making airflow adjustments. So Throughout the process, periodically, I'll be taking out, you know, sample, smelling it, looking at the color change from green to yellow gotcha. to the caramelization stage, and then also being able to hear first crack. That's okay, really nice. and what is first crack? So first crack is when all of the gas and all of the water and everything mm -hmm. just start exploding. So Fun. think about popcorn. You put popcorn in the microwave right. and you start to hear these pops. And that, think of coffee beans being first cracked. So the shell's cracking open, this gas and energy is just exploding out of the coffee bean. Gotcha. And Crazy. that's that's what that sound is. So once the beans have hit first crack, what's the next step? Eventually, within about a minute, minute and a half, we will drop the beans out of here. So they'll come out of the drum and go directly into the cooling tray. Okay. And so what this is gonna do, it's gonna rotate and the air is gonna suck all the heat down and okay. out the exhaust for about five minutes. We want all of the beans to cool quickly and at the same rate. After that, we'll drop the beans out of this chute right here. We will let them degas for about 24 hours. Awesome, dude. So I think that's everything we could possibly ask of Honest Coffee Roasters. You guys are amazing. Uh, dude, thank you so much. Yeah, this man. is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for stop number two, we are at Leapers Fort Distillery and believe it or not, Leapers Fort, Tennessee. And uh, it's super cold, it's been snowing, so let's go inside. Hey Lee, how's hey, it going, Cooper, man? How you doing, man? Good well, to see you. Welcome to Leapers Fort Distillery. Yeah, thanks for having me. Dude. Absolutely, glad you're here. Yeah, so I've heard there's a lot of history with this building. Yes, uh, this cabin we're sitting in was originally built in 1820. Wow. We moved this cabin about 20 miles from here and wow. rebuilt it log by log. No kidding. Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, we love this cabin. It screams Tennessee history, and we preach yeah. a lot of history here as well. Yeah, this is really awesome. Absolutely. I'm excited. Well, I know we're here to talk about whiskey, and we're going to walk through the process. But um, you want to try some whiskey? Yeah, let's try that. Absolutely. That's awesome. So uh, we have four whiskeys in front of you. Two of them are rye whiskeys. Okay. They're different color. Two of them are Tennessee whiskeys. Okay. Yes. The rye whiskeys have 70% rye. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tennessee whiskeys have 70% corn. Okay. Very different. Obviously, rye bread is very different than cornbread. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those differences should shine through in these whiskeys. Amazing. So with the unaged whiskeys, you can really see what the grains contribute to that whiskey unadulterated by the barrel. So uh, we're going to try this rye first. Okay. 
we don't nose whiskey like we do a wine. Okay. It's an intense experience. Sure is. It's, it's an assault <laughs> on the senses. With wine, we're really almost putting our nose into the glass and getting mm -hmm. a lot of those aromas. So right. With whiskey, we don't do that. Okay. Uh, we actually pick one nostril, any nostril awesome. will do. Uh, and you just kind of wave that whiskey in front of your nose mm -hmm. and breathe in with your mouth open. And really on this rye, you should get some sharp notes of, um, it sounds weird, but fruit almost. Yes, like some pineapple sweet. notes, things like that. Cheers. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, so that's very, very sweet. And as it gets to the end, it's, it's pretty clean toward the it end. It is. There's a lot of explosion of flavor up front. Right. Um, and then there's a really clean finish because the oils are light in a rye, so they don't hang with you a really long time. It's a good little bit of heat there at the end, too. It's yeah, nice, it, nice we, little... we call that a Kentucky hug or a Tennessee hug. Yeah, you want to feel awesome. that down your throat, not crazy long. So let's move on to the second bottle here. So it's the same whiskey, but it's just been one year in a barrel? Absolutely. So you can kind of see just from one year uh, the color. Absolutely. Uh, so color extraction happens pretty quickly, usually yeah. within the first year to 18 months. From a nose, it's very different. Mm -hmm. The influences of that barrel really shine through. The caramels, vanilla. Yeah. There's still a sharpness there that is um, uh, indicative of rye. Yeah, and you lose a little bit of the almost fruity sweetness. Absolutely. Um, and I imagine that's replaced with some of the some of the characters of the wood. Yeah, some of the tannins, the oak notes, mm -hmm. things like that. Absolutely. So cheers. Mm -hmm. So it's so interesting. Yeah, you definitely see what the wood starts to bring Absolutely. in. Absolutely. You can also tell it's not all the way matured Absolutely. yet. Absolutely, yes, you're right. At one years old, there's still what we call a little green wood flavor to it. Mm -hmm. After about three and a half to four years, that really starts to change. That whiskey's mellow. That finish is different too. Very different. Maybe more aromatic, is that yes, the right Yes, absolutely, the right a little more flavorful. I, I was so curious, because I don't feel like distilling whiskey is something you can decide to pick up on a weekend. How did you get into doing this, and, and where'd you get your start? When I was a teenager, mm -hmm. I was fascinated initially by the cultural heritage aspect of whiskey, how sure. that related back to uh, my ancestry, being Scots-Irish. We say to people that wherever you find Scotch-Irish people in limestone filtered water, mm -hmm. you'll probably find some whiskey hiding around somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that kind of captured my imagination was that you could take three inert ingredients mm -hmm. in a contraption and make something flammable. <laughs> I found a very archaic book on how to distill that was okay. written uh, in the 20s and um, built a little still. Built your own still? Yeah, a lot of a, a five gallon pressure cooker, some oh copper condensing gosh. line. Yeah, That's such an amazing story. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's, I guess, transition to this other whiskey. So this was a rye whiskey and this is what? This is a Tennessee whiskey, same as bourbon. It has to be made with at least 51% corn. Okay. From a palate standpoint, it should be the complete opposite of this rye whiskey. And that's because those corn oils are heavier than the rye oil, so they kind of stay with you a little bit longer. Okay. So, uh, Wonderful. Yeah. In the same process, you know, we distilled it, proofed it to 90, ran it to a filter, and there we go. There we go. Definitely much softer at the, at the beginning. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, and it is a really, it, it almost blooms into a really nice, like maybe bits of honey and vanilla or something yes. there on the sides of the tongue. But very different. Like it, so it, it starts different. out very mild and soft, mm -hmm. and then the back end is where you get a lot of flavor. Yeah, it's a lot and of that, flavor. And that's in the indicative back end. of a corn based spirit. So anyway, we have the one year old Tennessee whiskey. Okay. The same notes you saw in the, in the unaged form mm -hmm. should still be there. You're going to get the sweetness that you would get in the unaged form. I feel like you already get more aromatics maybe from you the do, wood. You do, absolutely. So those oak notes are a lot more prevalent. Especially there at the end. Yes, a very pronounced finish. Man, that's so good, all yes. so good. Yeah, yeah. So do they respond to wood differently? Are they getting maybe different things from the wood because of how they start as a spirit off the still? Absolutely, they break oh, down wow. the lignans in the wood differently, uh, expose different wood es esters uh, depending on the distillate. So rye, whiskey will age differently than a corn base uh, distillate like a, wow. a Tennessee whiskey or a bourbon. Sure. R&D in this industry is five years. Yeah. So but we start monitoring those barrels here uh, when they start turning about six months old. Sure. So you can really see even at this one year old level, these whiskeys are completely different and are gonna age differently in the barrel. Gotcha. Yes. Wow, that is yeah. incredible. Yeah, well, we've absolutely. talked so much about yeah. Stillhouse. Should right. we go to yeah, the Stillhouse? Yeah, let's go, let's go check it out. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, Cooper, welcome to the still house. Uh, this is our still, okay. centerpiece of the show. This is a production facility. We, cool. We're making whiskey as we speak right as now. You should. And so there's some hoses laying around. We just, we'll watch our stuff. Awesome. Here at Leapers Ford Distillery, we make Tennessee whiskey and bourbon. A lot of people ask me, what's the difference between whiskey and bourbon? Yeah, that's a great well, question. It's like you asking me, what's the difference between uh, a human and a mammal? 
Okay. All humans are mammals, but not all mammals are humans. Gotcha. Okay. So everything starts with corn for Tennessee whiskey and bourbon. Gotcha. Uh, we use a heritage non-GMO corn. Okay. It's grown on my farm up the road about That's four amazing. miles. That's amazing. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. In this stage of the operation, we we want to mill all these grains. What you need for basic fermentation to occur, you need mm -hmm. kind of three basic things, water, sugar, and yeast. So with grain, it's a little different. Uh, we have potential sugar in the form of starch. Got it. So the first step after we mill those grains right. is actually to perform what we call a mash cook. We want to convert all the starches in this grain Got to it. sugar. That is through enzymes in our barley malt. So we're using the amylase enzymes that are produced in this grain yep. to convert the starch to sugar. Got it. We call this hillbilly chemistry. Okay, great. The guys over in Scotland and Ireland figured this out 500 years ago. Uh huh. So this is our mash cooker. You want to go up? Yeah, let's go cool. up. I'll let you go first. Oh, thanks, man. Absolutely. I'm not nervous on ladders at all. <laughs> you are. Should well, be pretty stable. I'm fine. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty high up here. How big is this tank? So this is a thousand gallon tank. Okay. We'll fill this tank with about 650 gallons of limestone filtered water. Okay. Uh, we introduce steam to the water. Once it reaches 200 degrees, we'll start introducing those grains. Corn always goes in first, takes okay. a lot of energy or heat. So that needs the hotter water. Absolutely. The middle grain is the wheat and the rye. Let that rest for about an hour. At that point, we introduce that barley malt. Barley malt has to go in at 145 because of the delicacy of those enzymes in the grain. Gotcha. So uh, after about four hours, once that cooking time is finished, all the starch is converted to sugar, mm -hmm. we're going to use a portable pump. And we're actually, if you can see down there, we're going to pump this mash over to these wooden fermentation tanks over here. All right. Shall so we uh, that, that's that the next step of the Amazing. operation. Yep. Most people today don't use Cypress. Uh, okay. They use stainless steel. Hmm. Easier to clean, things like that. We use Cypress because they're very traditional. Awesome. We've been using Cypress fermentation tanks for a couple hundred years. Okay. We'll take about two gallons of water, take dry activated yeast, stir that into it, make a slurry. Okay. It actually uh, awakens the yeast cells. Nice. Yeast is a living organism in the fungus family. Cool. Uh, its primary function in life is to devour sugar. So, Same. Uh, <laughs> I feel that way too. <laughs> so uh, at that point, we're going to pour the yeast in into the mash. We're right. going to stir it very, very well. Okay. The first thing it's going to do is rapidly multiply. Okay. It's going to hit a critical mass after about six hours. Then once that happens, that yeast is going to start devouring the sugar in the tank. As that yeast consumes that sugar, mm -hmm. it's actually going to excrete alcohol as a <laughs> as a uh, byproduct. Wow. Sounds gross, but that's what alcohol is. We will then pump this mash right over to our still which Amazing. is the third part of the operation. Once we've finished our fermentation, right. uh, like I said, we've got 10% alcohol by volume in those 1,000 gallons of mash. Right. Uh, our still is a 500 gallon still. We call it a Scottish swan neck still. We actually uh, named her Ginger. Ginger, Because uh, she's it. a redhead. The reason we call it a Scottish swan neck still is the feature at the top. Right, looks Look, like a swan's neck. Yeah, it looks like a swan's neck, yeah. very simply. Uh, they've been using this type of still in Scotland going on about 500 years. So, Lee, what exactly is a still? So, a still is kind of a short hand term for a distillation device. Gotcha. It's really a contraption, for lack of a better word, where you boil a substance in, uh, inside of it and remove its different compounds. So, you're separating. Of, yes, it sounds very scientific, and it is. It is, for Going sure. back to that hillbilly chemistry. Thing. Wonderful. The boiling point of alcohol mm -hmm. in its pure state is about 174 degrees. Uh, the boiling point of water is obviously 212. Right. So we're, as distillers, we're taking advantage of that discrepancy in boiling points. Because the alcohol then, once it comes to a boil, is gonna rise through the top of the still? Absolutely. Gotcha. It's gonna travel uh, up the swan neck, down this uh, tube called the line arm here. Okay. Um, and then into this column over here. Okay. On this side of the still, we're condensing that alcohol vapor back into a liquid in the form of whiskey okay. and collecting it in different phases. Cool. So the first whiskey that comes off the still is very volatile. It has things that can actually make you blind. It has things oh, like uh, methanol in it, acetone. Oh, good. And aldehyde. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Things that you do not want to Dangerous drink. Dangerous stuff that you don't want to drink. Absolutely. We call those the heads. We mm -hmm. collect those two gallons of heads in a separate chamber in the back. They do not go into our finished whiskey. I see. The second part of the run is called the heart of the run. That's where the good, clean ethanol is coming over that makes yeah. the bulk of our whiskey. Cool. Our third part of that run is called the tails. There's oils in the grains that we're actually distilling. They actually add a lot of flavor to the whiskey. Gotcha. So uh, we'll try uh, some of the part of the run now. Uh, we kind of call this like a big redneck water fountain a little bit. Uh, uh, take a sip. It's about 137, 140 Ooh. proof. Be very, very careful with it. Mm -hmm. uh, should have a nice, what we call Tennessee hug on the back end. 
Should be very, very flavorful. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the way we, we want that to wow. be. Yes. Super aromatic Absolutely. there at the end, very yes. sweet. Yes. You know, distilled spirits are uh, pretty much the only things we ingest in our body that is flammable. Right. It sounds really crazy, uh, but what we're making here is a flammable consumable. Cool. Um, so I kind of show you a little bit about, about what you drank there. Okay. Um, this is a little parlor trick that we do. I see that. Oh, flame. wow. Your finger's on fire. Absolutely. <laughs> so That's now fine. inside of me. That's Abs amazing. Absolutely. So this is the pretty part of the steel. It's very mm -hmm. uh, elegant. The back side of the steel is kind of where a lot of the work's happening. <laughs> gotcha. Where we actually make those cuts we were talking about and things like that. If we're going to make Tennessee whiskey or bourbon, mm -hmm. by federal law, we have to bring that whiskey from 137 proof mm -hmm. down to below 125 proof. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll take a graduated cylinder like this, cool. fill that with a raw whiskey. We'll yep. float a proof hydrometer in it. Each proof point has a corresponding density. Once we know the proof, mm -hmm. we're gonna, we can do a calculation, figure out how much water we need to add to that whiskey to bring it down to below 125 proof. So we keep saying proof. What does proof mean? Cooper, if you were buying whiskey from me in say 1750, mm -hmm. uh, you were buying that whiskey from me in a barrel, uh, mm -hmm. or a crock, gotcha. you were taking my word for it how strong that whiskey was. As a consumer in the 1700s, what you would do uh, is you would take a spoon, mm -hmm. you would take a little bit of gunpowder, okay. you'd put it in the spoon, okay. uh, you'd pour the whiskey on top of the gunpowder, Right. Uh, you would light that whiskey. If the whiskey lit mm -hmm. and set off a flash of gunpowder, right. I had proved to you that that whiskey was worthy enough to buy. If it did not light, then I was trying to pull one You're over on you. You're a dirty liar. Yes, yeah, so I had too much water, I was trying to pull one over on you. We're, re amazing. we're rednecks in a wooden building, <laughs> yeah. so we don't proof that way anymore. Yeah, that's a good we idea. Use, we use science. From here, if that whiskey's destined to be bourbon whiskey, mm -hmm. it goes straight into the barrel and it won't see the light of day here for about five years. Wow, all right. So if that whiskey's destined to be Tennessee whiskey, mm -hmm. before it goes to the barrel, it actually gets pumped over to this contraption behind you. This copper grid here actually is a grid system with tiny little pinholes drilled into it. Oh, wow. So we're gonna pump that whiskey up to the top, we're gonna crack the valve, and the whiskey's gonna drip, drip, drip. So slow Very drip. slow drip, down through the sugar maple charcoal mm -hmm. into that bottom tank. That's crazy. You can kind of think of this uh, filtration system as kind of like a Brita filter for whiskey. Awesome. What that charcoal is doing is actually capturing some of those heavier oils mm -hmm. and smoothing that whiskey out. And we're cool. actually making Tennessee whiskey right now, so if you want to, you can fill your own barrel, oh, sign it, and to fill uh, come a barrel. back in about five years and we'll try it. Yes, please. Absolutely. The hole in a barrel, sounds uh -huh. crude, it's actually called a bung hole. Right, this that's where it bung. comes from. It's an old Scottish it's word. It's a family show. This is actually a pump, so it pumps the whiskey into the barrel. Okay, looks kind of like I'm filling up my car. Bit. Yes, <laughs> so hold that for a second. I will. All right. I am so excited. <laughs> this is your throttle, so to speak. So okay. once you turn that, you're going to be filling that barrel with whiskey. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. It's not the noise I expected. No, it's a little loud. Um, how long will it take to fill this barrel? So it'll take us about eight minutes to fill this barrel. All right. We're, we're not a big shop here. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have automatic fillers. We do everything by hand here. Love it. Uh, this is about as automated as we get here. Oh! There you go. <laughs> Full barrel. Wow. Let me do this for you. Yeah. You hand that to me. So here's what we're going to do now. Okay. Uh, I don't have Thor's hammer, but I do have a plastic mallet. Perfect. Uh, this is your plug. Oh so uh, you can do the honors. Okay. You got to get it flush. You're going to you're gonna have to beat it. Yeah. You would show you how to do it. <laughs> Wait, show me the four. Show me the four. You can't hurt it, man. Oh. Hey, that was a team effort, man. I'm glad man. I did that all by myself. <laughs> no one helps. Hey, so to market your barrel, though, you got to tag the head. Oh, amazing. Yeah, then four or five years, man, we'd come back and we'll tap it and see what's going I on. I will. That's uh, the end of the line as far as making the whiskey. Okay. Um, there's one less step and that's barrel aging. What oh. happens in that barrel? Whiskey gets 100% of its color mm -hmm. from the barrel. Any whiskey that you're making in the world. Sure. Uh, for Tennessee whiskey and bourbon, at least 65% of flavor profile is coming out of the barrel. Wow, that's All, a lot. Absolutely, it is, yeah. it is. They call American whiskeys barrel forward whiskeys mm -hmm. because of that. And really the barrel is what makes the whiskey. Right. It becomes a different creature when it hits that barrel. Incredible. Absolutely. So we're aging whiskey right now. We can't wait for it to grow up. Yeah, to come dude. Back. Amazing. Yeah. Guys, come down here. Come check the place out. Uh, Lee, amazing. Thanks so much. Thanks, Cooper.
So for our last stop in Nashville, we're at Attaboy, which is a classic cocktail bar in East Nashville. I'm gonna sit down with Brandon Bram Hall. I really think you're gonna dig this place. How's it going, dude? Good, man. Good nice to you. meet you. So Attaboy seems a little different than your average bar. What kind of separates you guys from everybody else? We are primarily focused on classic cocktails. So gotcha. not a bar where we're going to have a ton of taps, mm -hmm. uh, Jack and Coke, stuff like that. I mean, uh, primarily it's going to be alcohol mixed in a glass. And uh, we're kind of scrapping the paperwork thing and the menu sense. Kind of serve as the middleman. You know, we'd rather have a chat and, and let it be personal and a little more intimate instead of just a guest scanning down a list of 10 drinks and being like, I'll settle on that because it's got like two things I like in there. Um, so you mentioned before that you work off of classic cocktails. Is that like a specific era or a specific type of spirit? What does that mean? Uh, we're looking at the period of 1890 to 1930. Gotcha. So if you kind of dial back, you know, before Prohibition, mm -hmm. it really was considered like a golden era for bartending and cocktails. Okay. So you had a lot of people who were career bartenders, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't this transient field that it kind of became in the 90s and early 2000s, we feel sure. like. But kind of folded into that was a simple approach to making drinks that produced a lot of things that are staples today. Old Fashions, Manhattans, mm -hmm. Negronis, Dark and Stormies, Daiquiris, Mint Juleps. That was all created in that time period. So for us, we kind of want to look back and we think the simpler, the better. Right. And we'd rather focus on quality spirits, fresh juices and syrups, and good ice. And so you mentioned the quality spirits. Uh, what goes into choosing what spirits you have behind the bar? I'm gonna look at the proof of the spirit and make sure that it's not too soft, it's not too hot, it'll mm -hmm. balance and mix well with other ingredients. But then also just tasting it side by side with other things. You know, we don't put anything in a cocktail or a drink here that we don't stand by. What's the story of Attaboy in general? Myself and my two partners all worked for this gentleman named Sasha Petrowski, okay. a native New Yorker. He went and found a listing in the newspaper for a small commercial space in the Lower East Side in 1999. He goes and shows up to look at that space. Mm -hmm. Turns out the landlord is the father of a childhood friend of his. No kidding. The guy tells him I would never lease to a bar, however, you know my son, but if you're gonna do your bar, I live upstairs, I don't wanna know there's a bar there. So he began a bar with purely the goal of, I wanna make some good drinks and have more of a neighborhood vibe, but I also have this constriction of I, I can't have signs, I can't have lines up front, I can't wow. be making a lot of noise. So he employed some hobbies and interests of like the big band jazz and swing era, mm -hmm. menswear from Prohibition era, all kind of eccentric things that he sure. was into, but kind of wrapped up in this is uh, Sasha was not a technologically advanced person. Okay. So he was like, I don't know how to work a printer. Right. We'll just sure. talk to people. Okay. So that's how the no menu thing kind of got its legs. When it came time that he wanted to move that bar to a larger location, mm -hmm. he passed the keys down to them. He wow. said, it's okay. your turn. You guys do what you want in this room. Oh, interesting. We wanted to kind of, you know, play the music we're into and, sure. and keep the service and the spirit alive, but just kind of raise Adapt. the volume, loosen the collar, and make people feel a little less stuffy in there. You know? And that's amazing. I think uh, this is probably a good time to go behind the bar and start making some drinks. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it. Since a big part of the experience here at Attaboy is the ordering process, I've grabbed some volunteers at the bar here. This is Rob and Emily. And you know what, Brandon? I'm just gonna let you do your thing now. Cool. So a uh, quick little rundown. We're doing everything out of menu. The idea is to kind of bounce the ball back to your court. Let me know a couple things you're digging. The base spirit's a great starting point or a style of drink you might want to mimic or riff on. And on the back end, if you got allergies, just keep me up on those. We'll just talk through that and I'll take care of the rest. Sweet. Cool. I like Manhattans. Okay. I tend to like Irish whiskeys. Okay. I like full-bodied flavor, but without a lot of teeth. I don't know if that's a official Okay, word, so but... yeah, rounder, not as sharp. Yeah, okay. And any flavors to try to roll in there or stay away from? I want you to be creative. Okay. No allergies, yeah. right? Nope. Cool. Uh, Emily. So I, on the other hand, I like the sweet stuff. Yeah. Um, mm. Fruity, sweet. My favorite cocktail is a margarita. Cool. That okay. helps, so I like tequila. Yeah. And I'm just gonna let you kind of run with it. Awesome, thanks so much, guys. Uh, Let's go make some drinks. Yeah. We'll be back. All right, so Brandon, where do you want to start? Uh, I'm gonna get a uh, citrus drink set up here. Okay. Um, leave it a shrouded mystery for the time being until we okay, get it like going, it. but we're gonna juice up real quick. So you fresh squeeze all of your fruit juice here. We try to juice all the menu here. Start with some strawberries. And what did you just grab? This is orgeat. So this is a toasted almond syrup we make in house here. Do you really? Uh, Amazing. Traditionally kind of used in a lot of tiki drinks, but we are applying this in a little bit of a different way. Okay. And this is going for Emily's drink? Yeah. Awesome. So when you hear Emily kind of describe what she likes, what sort of words are you looking for, and how does that dictate where you're gonna grab from the bar? You can kind of split the bill. There's dessert drinks, 
There are shaken drinks with okay. citrus, mm -hmm. uh, and there's stirred cocktails. So stirred cocktails will fall with your Manhattans, your martinis, things like that. Okay. Shaken drinks can be anything from a daiquiri to a dark and stormy to a Tom Collins. Gotcha. Whiskey sour, anything in that range. So there's a bit more latitude anything there. Anything you're gonna shake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, dessert drinks are kind of that outlier where it's cream and eggs with no citrus. Amazing. Yeah. So hearing that she likes a margarita, mm -hmm. I immediately go to tequila and citrus. Perfect. But she has a prescriptor of citrus and fruit and a little sweeter. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm gonna kind of guide away to uh, something that's not as tart and a little richer. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. So I'm just gonna get a light muddle of that fruit. Okay. We shake with all large format ice here, so we don't wanna oh, over muddle that and let the ice kind of do some of that work. All right. So we're grabbing our tequila. Yes. What are we using today? Uh, I'm gonna go Altos. Just okay. a nice Blanco tequila. Okay. So now I've got that built. Let's go get Rob set up. So what are we doing here? What is so this? So just kind of going off the Manhattan template that okay. Rob described, but we're going to lean on some Irish whiskey instead. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of break down what normally is a vermouth foundation and swap that out for a couple of little different things. But still keep Very that Irish cool. whiskey. Very cool. What did we just pour in? Uh, a little Benedictine. OK. Uh, it's an herbaceous, brandy-based liqueur from France. OK. And then this is going to be an Amontillado. So this is a dry sherry from Spain that leans on some kind of nutty, savory notes. Very cool. And then we'll pull our Irish whiskey. Awesome. There you Get go. Get that set up inside. Now it fits nice. And we're just going to roll some of the cocktail over the top of the ice and let that whole thing open up. And just real quick to touch on, what is the reason for the bigger uh, ice cube? The larger the ice cube, the less surface area we have. Right. Therefore, mm -hmm. the liquid is going to dilute it a slower. Rate. Much slower. So, so it's all, it I mean, better. it looks beautiful and obviously it's for presentation, mm -hmm. but also it is practical in the way that we're trying to get you a drink that's going to last a long yeah. time and not get watered down too much. Not just a weird ice cube, it has a purpose. I love it. Yeah, exactly. So going back to Emily's drink? Yeah, just kind of doing the same setup, getting that ice cube uh, to fit glass. And, you know, kind of our old saying here is to wake it up, not to put it to bed. So we are going to shake pretty damn hard. All right. Uh, but yeah, that's a workout. Yeah. So it looks like we're getting toward garnish stage. Yep. For Rob's drink, we're going to set up with a lemon twist. And lemon will just kind of brighten it up a little bit, dry it out a touch. And what are you doing there, squeezing that? Just releasing the oils. So let those sitting on top of the drink. Give a quick once over on the rim of the glass. And then Emily's drink, we finish with a little grated nutmeg. Oh, wonderful. That is awesome. Put it on there. All right. And you do a little taste test. Make that's sure we're not poisoning you guys. You yeah, know? that's a fun part of the job. Yeah. Hello, guinea pigs. Hey, guys. <laughs> Rob, this is a little Manhattan riff called Old Barrel. All right, so, all right. Moment of truth, Rob. Give it a shot. Oh, that's great. That's, yeah, that's awesome. awesome. It's good really, uh, it's, com it's got a complex combination of yeah, flavors. Yeah, suitable to the weather. Fantastic. You know? Awesome, man. Awesome. Emily, awesome. we've got a strawberry and This is the most beautiful drink I've ever seen. All right. <laughs> so, and this right. sounds like a dumb question, but does it go in? Metal spoon straw if you need it. Yeah. But, and this part goes down. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, you're good. Oh my gosh. Hit the spot. This is my new favorite cocktail. Go for Yay. It. Awesome. Ridiculous. Oh, that's so awesome. So good. Yay. Ridiculous. High five. Way to go, Brandon. Yeah. Wow, uh, so that feels like a good a place as any to call it a day here at Bottle Barreled and Brewed and here at Attaboy. Brandon, absolutely amazing, dude. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. All right, let's roll us a barrel. Oh, a barrel that I totally did the bunghole of. I feel like I'm in Donkey Kong. <laughs> think he was a whiskey guy? I think he was. <laughs> and right about here? Perfect. Amazing. Absolutely. Got it. Good job, my friend. Thanks. Thank you. Here at Bottled, Barreled, and Brewed, we're all about excellence over excess. So please, enjoy responsibly.